I confess.
therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. O Emmanuel, our King and Lawgiver, the hope of the nations and their Saviour, come and save us, O Lord our God. Nearly ten years ago, ten years this Friday to be more precise, I went to Mass for the first time as a believer, a person of faith, you might say. I had, been, I had made my first Holy Communion as a child and I had been to Mass two or three times after that, uh, but I would certainly not have considered myself a practicing Catholic. So following an experience of religious conversion as an adult, I chose Christmas Day as the day to start practicing again, if not for the first time. Now I must confess, I hadn't prepared myself very well and I went on my own, so uh, the etiquette that one only learns by going to mass often was bound to escape me. Um, I remember I was particularly embarrassed at the offertory uh, when the collection basket started going around uh, because I hadn't brought any money with me and the thought suddenly crossed my mind that if you didn't put any coins in the basket, you might be asked to leave. So um, I thought that might have been some kind of uh, membership fee for attending mass. Um, the lady with the basket was approaching where I was sitting and I wasn't sure what to do. So as discreetly as I could, I slowly started sliding towards the other end of the pew to make sure she couldn't reach me. And then as she walked down the other aisle, she, I moved back to my place and she didn't say anything to me, to my great relief. Uh, she didn't hurl the basket at me and I wasn't asked to leave. But the thing that uh, surprised me the most, and I've always remembered uh, from this Mass, was actually the Gospel of the Mass of the day. Um, I hadn't checked the readings beforehand, so it really hit me with full force. Um, it even moved me, you could say, uh, when the priest went up to the lectern and read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. It was Christmas Day, so in my ignorance and prejudice, I had expected some kind of sentimental vignette with the baby in the manger and uh, the shepherds, the beasts, etc. Uh, but instead, there was something quite abstract, uh, something otherworldly. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There are, to my knowledge, not many Advent hymns or Christmas carols composed with these words. They would make for a rather strange message in a Christmas cracker. So there at the peak of the liturgy of Christmas Day, I was struck by something rather unchristmassy. And I've always thought there's, there's a right instinct in perceiving a certain contrast, a contrast that gives us two perspectives about Christmas. And I say a contrast and not an opposition because I think that both perspectives are complementary and necessary. On the one hand, we have what we may call uh, the Emmanuel point of view. Emmanuel meaning God is with us, the, mean, the name that we give to God to Christ more precisely, the point of view uh, of us as a faithful people gathering round uh, the child Jesus in adoration, uh, bringing our homage of music, celebration, piety. On the other hand is what I suppose could be called the divine or eternity's point of view, though we have no idea of what things look like from that side, but we are granted some glimpses of it. The baby in the manger will one day say, as a grown-up man, before Abraham was, I am and anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. From the Emmanuel point of view, we celebrate that God has entered human history. But from this other perspective, we are reminded that there is, in a sense, no time when God was absent from human affairs. That at Christmas, we also celebrate that our own humanity has been joined to the divine, taken up into eternity. 
this divine point of view reminds us that each one of us is called to share in the life of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, a community that has been waiting from the beginning in eager expectation for the advent of each one of us, for our own birth into their communion of love. Now, there is, however, a truth which is only conveyed from the Emmanuel point of view, and that is that none of us is aware of God having been with us from the beginning. In fact, our relationship with God only comes about after many other relationships, after we are born and brought up by those on whom we depend, after we learn to play, to explore the world around us, to make friends, perhaps after we have fallen in love for the first time and have known suffering and bitterness. Some of those relationships pass without leaving a mark on our lives, whereas others lead us to God. We might even say that we owe our faith to them. Some people may have become the primary means through which we are supposed to serve and to love God. Others may at times have been in competition with him. We may have had to leave people and places behind on account of our faith. Those who were dear to us may have turned their back on us, and painfully so. Yet, God serves himself of the web of human relationships to which we belong, to enter into our lives. And he does so not to tear it apart, but to mend it, to weave us into another web of relationships that transcends the boundaries of time and space, where we are in the company of believers from all ages, of the saints and the angels, and which has the communion of the Trinity as its center. To this divine communion, we bring all our relations with us so that our loves may rest in God's love that they may have life and not perish, that they may be kept with fonder care than we could have kept them. At the same time, paradoxically, when God comes into our lives, he asks us to stand aside our communities and to follow him unconditionally. And this invariably involves the experience of solitude. Here we see how both our perspectives on Christmas are mutually necessary. For there is a solitude that none of us can ultimately escape, that human company the affection of friends and family can only postpone for so long. There is a space in the deepest recesses of our hearts that is reserved to God and nobody else, not even a spouse. Jesus, in his early life, seems to have been unwilling to compromise on the time he spent alone praying to his Father, no matter how much he was needed by his contemporaries or how much he delighted in the company of his disciples. And it's Jesus himself who extends his invitation to us to go into our room close the door and pray to our Father who sees in the secret. Now, it needs little commentary on my part, especially in view of this year that comes to an end, that it is not always easy to find God in moments of silence, that this may feel arduous, burdensome. We may already live in some unwanted solitude, or we may have to fight to find time for ourselves. Christ's invitation, nevertheless, stands. And he insists that solitude is neither a curse nor a luxury, but a privileged place of encounter with God. To learn to inhabit it is certainly an art that is only learned with practice, but our faith provides us with an abundance of gifts to help us transform solitude into a tangible token of God's presence. We can turn, for example, to the frequent recitation of the rosary, to the reading of scripture, or to very simple gestures such as bowing before a crucifix or blessing ourselves with holy water. But in preparation for this Christmas, I'd like to suggest three exercises that might help us to turn our solitude into a pathway to God and to those whom we love. First is prayer in the technical sense of asking for things, to have the courage and the humility to stand empty-handed before God and to acknowledge that we need many things, we lack many things. This is really an exercise in honesty and authenticity about our circumstances and he prepares us to receive good things from God and to see how much he's given us already. This takes me to memory, the second exercise. Perhaps we don't think of memory often in connection with prayer, but if we read the Psalms, for instance, uh, we'll see that we're constantly encouraged to keep alive the memory of the things that God has done for us. Both prayer and memory arise from the heart, according to scripture. That wonderful French author, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry wrote in the opening pages of The Little Prince that all grown-ups were children first, but few of them remember it. And you too were children in the faith, as St. Paul might say. So we can ask God in our prayer, how did you come into my life? When did you first move my heart? 
In the third place, we have the imagination, not in the sense of letting our minds wander into the endless possibilities of an uncertain future, but allowing us to examine, to examine the future in God's company, like two friends looking in the same direction. So we may ask, what would my life be if I had more faith? Perhaps what are the things that are holding me back from flourishing, from deepening my relationship with God? And so if we commit ourselves to some solitude with the Lord before this Christmas, if we bring to mind through prayer, memory and imagination, the many ways in which he is present in our lives, we will be responding to God's invitation into the communion of love which he is. And by doing so, so we will be drawing others with us. We will become bearers of our Lord's own presence and company, a Lord who has promised us, I am with you always until the end of time. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, meek and humble of heart, you offer to those who follow you a yoke that is good to bear, a burden that is light. Accept, we beg you, our prayer and work of this day and grant us the rest we need, that we may be ever more willing to serve you, who lives and reigns forever and ever. May the almighty and merciful Lord grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Just on behalf of Father Robert, our prior, and all the brethren here at Blackfriars, I'd like to thank you for joining us in these days of preparation for the coming of our Lord. It's been a wonderful joy for me to see our student brothers sort of come and make their debut on the live stream. And it's consoling to think that although our preachers are new, the texts which have guided us are ancient. They've been echoing out across the centuries. They've been sung in times of pandemic and pestilence before and we'll gather again next year to sing them again. We can't predict what the world will be like then, what changes we'll face in the coming year. But the message that these antiphons give us will be the same, hidden away in the first letters of the antiphon, read backwards, aero crass, tomorrow I will be with you. Tomorrow the joy of Christmas will be with us, wherever we are. And as we gather in this church tomorrow evening, your intentions will have a place in our prayers. For now, 
let us join our prayers to Mary, our mother, whose Christmas joy we will share tomorrow. Fidelium animi per misericordiam Dei requiescant in pace.